Now, in a world where so much has been reimagined by technology, you'd be right to ask why there's approximately 9,000 diseases today without treatment. And you'd be wondering why there are 300 million people suffering from rare diseases for which no treatment will ever be developed as long as the current economic model exists. Couple this with the fact that, as we said in the, um, in the question that was posed to you earlier, we live in a time when our lives are likely to extend into our 90s. Now that's far beyond what we imagined when we were young. But while we may, live young, we may live longer lives, we can also expect to live those lives unwell. Eight out of 10 elderly people are affected by debilitating diseases, such as cancer, Alzheimer's, and diabetes. This is already placing an unprecedented burden on families and society, and the cost of developing new medicines continues to rise unabated. Last year, national health spending in the US hit $3.5 trillion. Now what drives this staggering figure is the fact that it now costs $2.5 billion to take a new drug from discovery to FDA approval. It also takes 10 to 15 years and there's a 97% failure rate. I've had the privilege of witnessing my share of technology revolutions since I arrived in Silicon Valley in the late 1980s. And I can tell you this one perhaps has more potential than any other to bring about change that we so desperately need in healthcare. Now, artificial intelligence is something we often hear with trepidation, but it's actually augmenting human intelligence in ways we never thought possible. It's giving us superpowers to move beyond our own limitations to discover breakthrough treatments for diseases we have until now been unable to cure. Now, as you know, artificial intelligence is very much a part of your everyday lives. We have it on our phones with Siri. We have it in our homes with Alexa and Google Home. And of course, in Spotify, Netflix, and Amazon, they all make re re recommendations for the music we listen to, the films we watch, and the purchases we make. So why then has technology not made a bigger impact in medicine? The simple explanation is that the understanding of the causes of disease let alone finding cures for disease, is incredibly difficult. The human body is one of the, the largest known data systems. We have over 37 trillion cells. It's the end result of millions of years of evolution and an infinite number of factors and permutations. The deeper we go into the understanding of the human body, such as sequencing the human genome, the more we realize there's so much left to uncover and to understand. And the problem is not just the complexity of biology, it's that we as human are limited in the amount of information we can absorb and process. To give you a sense of just how much information is out there, consider the biomedical domain alone. There are 10,000 new scientific papers published every day. Add this to millions of patents, chemical databases, patient trials, and countless sources of public information that, that is available today, and you quickly realize that it simply isn't possible for mere mortals to process all that information. We haven't yet hit that steep arc of innovation and exponential advancement in biology and life sciences that we've experienced in computer science and engineering because we're limited by the progress of human understanding until now. The rise of computational medicine is already giving us better tools to detect cancer, to read radiology scans, and to diagnose medical conditions. Even Apple got into the game last week with its new watch, which sports your own personal electrocardiogram. But we're just at the beginning. Artificial intelligence can help us uncover relationships between diseases and their symptoms, drugs and their effect, patient endotypes, responders, non-responders, and much more relationships that would previously not been uncovered due to the sheer volume and complexity of information. This is exactly what we're trying to tackle at Benevolent AI. We built the world's only end-to-end -end computational and experimental platform for drug discovery that spans data ingestion all the way to drug development. We are combining the power of computational medicine and advanced artificial intelligence with the principles of open systems 
to transform the way drugs are discovered, designed, and tested. So how does this all work? The benevolent platform is continuously ingesting and analyzing unstructured and structured biomedical information, from academic papers to compound databases to clinical trials and scientific patents. This information is combined with deep learning to create the world's leading bioscience knowledge graph, coupled with an automated platform for hypothesis generation and validation, followed by the design, the refinement, and synthesis of molecules. This powerful engine is used by our scientists to find new ways to treat disease and to personalize drugs for the patients that will benefit most from them. Now this isn't about running code on powerful computers. You can't develop and test drugs in the cloud. That's why earlier this year we acquired a drug development facility in Cambridge, making us the only AI company that is able to take our own drugs from discovery to the clinic. But you might be asking, why do you need companies like Benevolent AI to lead this revolution? After all, why can't Big Pharma, why can't they simply use AI to speed up drug development? Well, they are making progress, but the answer is likely the same answer that explains why each of the major industry disruptions we've seen in the past decade were not created by an incumbent. Amazon, which in the past few weeks became a trillion dollar company, wasn't invented by a retailer. Uber wasn't invented by a limousine company. Netflix wasn't invented by a television network. And LinkedIn wasn't invented by a recruiting firm. We simply can't rely on traditional incumbents to lead this revolution either. At Benevolent, we have a unique way of working that brings engineering and drug discovery together to create something that's radically more valuable than the sum of its parts. We have experts across data science, machine learning, informatics, and engineering literally working side by side with drug discoverers, crossing traditional boundaries and breaking down knowledge silos. And we are working on some of the most complex and challenging diseases, including ALS. Motor neuron disease is a devastating disease that destroys the nervous system and currently has no cure. It is poorly understood and immensely complicated. There are 30 genes associated with this disease, but 85% of patients do not have any of those genes making it difficult, if not impossible, to find treatments that work across such diverse patient populations. Using our platform, we have recently reached an important milestone, identifying several novel targets that we are now collaborating with Citron, the world-leading ALS treatment center in Sheffield, to develop a clinic clinical compound for testing within the next year. Every day, we push the boundaries of artificial intelligence and machine learning to unlock the power of decades of research to understand the underlying cause of disease and develop new treatments for patients. But we can't do this alone. This is why we're opening our platform to scientists, research institutes, and pharma companies to scale ideas and to test more hypotheses. We aim to foster greater collaboration and to connect data from typically siloed disease-specific entities. This will bring about the large-scale innovation and scientific discoveries required to truly transform the industry. And what gets me really excited is that we're creating a new model for drug discovery and development that will dramatically increase the number of treatments for patients. It will also expand the knowledge base and insights available to scientists and researchers, elevating the knowledge of us all. The benevolent platform unites biology, chemistry, data science and engineering, but more importantly, it does it with purpose. In this age of unprecedented technological advancement, I believe it's our obligation to find new ways to treat even the most challenging diseases. And I couldn't be more proud to be part of the benevolent team that is working towards that goal. Thank you. Thank you, Joanna. Thank you. Now, I just have a couple of super quick questions. This is sort of, I mean, mind-blowing to listen to, but for you, you must have sort of immersed yourself in this since taking up your position. Um, as a company, how would you describe the biggest challenge you think you face as an organization? How does that seem to you uh, driving the organization? I think one of the biggest challenges is um, 
is uniting this diverse set of, of scientists. You know, we have the leaders in data science and technology, but always also working with biologists and chemists and, you know, experts in bioinformatics and cheminformatics. And it's bringing all those disciplines together because we really need each other. Yeah. That synergy is really what's at the heart of the breakthroughs that we're achieving. And, you know, this idea that I've spoken about this for the first time today, um, about the importance of opening that platform. Because we have the end-to-end -end platform all the way from data to the ultimate drug, it's absolutely vital that we have the cooperation with leading research institutes, scientists, you know, technology companies. Partnerships are going to be the key right. because as much work as we're doing together, you know, we, we need to scale that and we need to bring more treatments to patients. Yes, and because of that facility you hinted at in Cambridge, to what extent does that mean you are yourselves on the way to becoming a big pharma of tomorrow? You must get asked this all the time, but uh, it, that's what's happening, is it? Well, we need the flexibility to, um, to do the testing to ensure that we, if you think about this, we are able to refine that proposition before it gets to the clinic. And, and we are able to accelerate the success rate, the potential success rate of developing um, new drugs and delivering a successful product to market. And I think, you know, if, if you were to develop a, a pharma company today, you would develop benevolent AI. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, so AI is um, obviously, as you know, being discussed everywhere at the moment. In your role, is there a particular misconception that you seem to have to find yourself correcting or that seems to crop up because it's being confronted by so many people. But what would you say by way of correcting well, I think this, the experiments that we see show time and again that machines are incredible and they're facilitating and augmenting, but you need that oversight of the scientists. You need someone to look at that data in a different way. So, you know, um, I was reading an oncology study and it was talking about how machines were so successful at reading various things in radiology and scans, but then synthesizing that information and coming up with the right diagnosis for the patient requires the, the technical expertise and the years of, of, of work that you know, a technician has yeah. to ensure that those, come, those two things come together. So yeah. it's not gonna be a time where machines are replacing humans. It's definitely going to be about human augmentation. Okay, very interesting. Now, speaking of that oversight by uh, clinicians, one form of oversight is government, something you have experience of. So your message, and I'm sure you've delivered it already, your message to our new Secretary of State for Health, Matt Hancock, what should he be bearing in mind to unlock the potential of this? Well, I was really happy that Matt got the brief because, you know, having been the digital minister, he's well across all these issues. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they've been forming, you know, c groups of... Um, you know, industry experts coming together and um, giving them great advice, and I feel confident that our voices are being heard. Okay, so there's a sort of okay, a, a sort of a warmth there. But if you were to really challenge and encourage them, something that they could really focus on, do a bit better on, where where would you give them a push? Well, the past couple of years in government, the UK has been um, ahead of the world in opening up data sets, and I think if we were to um, give one message to government, it would be the importance of of course, anonymizing those data sets, but bringing that patient information into the, the domain in which scientists can use it and can benefit from that knowledge and expertise. I mean, the National Health Service is, you know, globally leading in terms of research and development into all kinds of diseases, and they have that frontline experience of diagnosing patients yeah. for, for decades and generations, and that information would be immensely valuable to the scientists and researchers that we work with. Right, and in terms of that global reputation, to what extent do you think we are keeping up technologically with that reputation? Where do we sit globally? You've got an international perspective on this. What's your sense? Do you know what? I, I think you have the knowledge quarter over in um, King's Cross yeah. area. You know, you have the Alan Turing Institute, the Crick Institute, all of these in incredible um, research um, hubs and you know, we're able to attract world-class attention in the UK, or world-class talent, sorry, in the UK, and, um, you know, we don't have any trouble filling the jobs, but we are absolutely hiring, so <laughs> have a look and <laughs> refer your friends because there's a lot of really important roles that are open here in London. We have a new office in um, New York, we're in Belgium, and a few other places, Cambridge, of course, and we're always hiring. Great. So CVs at the coffee break. Okay. Well, it's good. Uh, thank you for giving us a glimpse of the benevolent AI journey. It sets us up very nicely for these conversations that are to come. But for now, Baroness Joanna Shields, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. Lovely to see you. Thank you.